Chapter Five, Arabian Tunnel. The same day, I reported to Conseil and Ned Land that part of the foregoing conversation directly concerning them. When I told them we would be lying in Mediterranean waters within two days, Conseil clapped his hands, but the Canadian shrugged his shoulders. "An underwater tunnel!" he exclaimed. "A connection between two seas! Who ever heard of such malarkey?" "Ned, my friend," Conseil replied. "Had you ever heard of the Nautilus?" No, yet here it is. So don't shrug your shoulders so blithely, and don't discount something with the feeble excuse that you've never heard of it. We'll soon see," Ned Land shot back, shaking his head. After all, I'd like nothing better than to believe in your captain's little passageway, and may heaven grant it really does take us to the Mediterranean. The same evening, at latitude twenty-one degrees thirty minutes north, the Nautilus went afloat on the surface of the sea and drawing nearer to the Arab coast. I spotted Jidda, an important financial centre for Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and the East Indies. I could distinguish with reasonable clarity the overall effect of its buildings. The ships made fast along its wharves, and those bigger vessels whose draught of water required them to drop anchor at the port's offshore mooring. The sun, fairly low on the horizon, struck full force on the houses in this town, accenting their whiteness. Outside the city limits, some wood or reed huts indicated the quarter where the Bedouin lived. Soon, Jida faded into the shadows of evening, and the Nautilus went back beneath the mildly phosphorescent waters. The next day, February ten, several ships appeared running on our opposite tack. The Nautilus resumed its underwater navigating, but at the moment of our noon sights, the sea was deserted, and the ship rose again to its waterline. With Ned and Conseil, I went to sit on the platform. The coast to the east looked like a slightly blurred mass in a damp fog. Leaning against the sides of the skiff, we were chatting of one thing and another. When Ned Land stretched his hand toward a point in the water, saying to me, "See anything out there, Professor?" "No, Ned," I replied. "But you know I don't have your eyes." "Take a good look," Ned went on. "They are ahead to starboard, almost level with the beacon. Don't you see a mass that seems to be moving around?" "Right," I said, observing carefully. "I can make out something like a long blackish object on the surface of the water." A second Nautilus," Conseil said. "No," the Canadian replied. "Unless I'm badly mistaken, that's some marine animal." "Are there whales in the Red Sea?" Conseil asked. "Yes, my boy," I replied. "They're sometimes found here." "That's no whale," continued Ned Land, whose eyes never strayed from the object they had sighted. "We're old chums, whales and I, and I couldn't mistake their little ways." "Let's wait and see," Conseil said. "The Nautilus is heading that direction, and we'll soon know what we're in for." In fact, that blackish object was soon only a mile away from us. It looked like a huge reef stranded in mid-ocean. What was it? I still couldn't make up my mind. Oh, it's moving off! It's diving! Ned exclaimed. Damnation! What can that animal be? It doesn't have a forked tail like baleen whales or sperm whales, and its fins look like sawed-off limbs. But in that case, I put. Good Lord! The Canadian went on. It's rolled over on its back and it's raising its breasts in the air. It's a siren," Conseil exclaimed. "With all due respect to matter, it's an actual mermaid." The word "siren" put me back on track, and I realized that the animal belonged to the order Sirenia, marine creatures that legends have turned into mermaids, half woman, half fish. No, I told Conseil, that's no mermaid. It's an unusual creature of which only a few specimens are left in the Red Sea. That's a dugong. Order Sirenia, group Pisciforma, subclass Monodelphia, class Mammalia, branch Vertebrata. Conseil replied, and when Conseil has spoken, there's nothing else to be said. Meanwhile, Ned Land kept staring. His eyes were gleaming with desire at the sight of that animal. His hands were ready to hurl a harpoon. You would have thought he was waiting for the right moment to jump overboard and attack the creature in its own element. Oh, sir, he told me in a voice trembling with excitement, I've never killed anything like that. His whole being was concentrated in this last word. Just then, Captain Nemo appeared on the platform. He spotted the dugong. He understood the Canadian's frame of mind and addressed him directly. If you held a harpoon, Mister Land, wouldn't your hands be itching to put it to work? Positively, sir. And for just one day, would it displease you to return to your fisherman's trade and end this citation to the list of those you've already hunted down? It wouldn't displease me one bit. All right, you can try your luck. Thank you, sir," Ned replied, his eyes ablaze. Only the captain went on. I urge you to aim carefully at this animal in your own personal interest. 
"'Is the Dedong dangerous to attack?' I asked, despite the Canadian's shrug of the shoulders. "'Yes, sometimes,' the captain replied. "'These animals have been known to turn on their assailants and capsize their longboats. "'But with Mr. Land that danger isn't to be feared. "'His eye is sharp, his arm is sure. "'If I recommend that he aim carefully at this Dedong, "'it's because the animal is justly regarded as fine game, "'and I know Mr. Land doesn't despise a choice morsel.' "'Aha!' the Canadian put in. "'This beast offers the added luxury of being good to eat?' "'Yes, Mr. Land. Its flesh is actual red meat, highly prized, and set aside throughout Malaysia for the tables of aristocrats. Accordingly, this excellent animal has been hunted so bloodthirstily that, like the manatee relatives, it has become more and more scarce.' "'In that case, Captain,' Conseil said in all seriousness, "'on the off chance that this creature might be the last of its line, wouldn't it be advisable to spare its life in the interest of science?' "'Maybe,' the Canadian answered. "'It would be better to hunt it down in the interest of mealtime.' "'Then proceed, Mr. Land,' Captain Nemo replied. "'Just then, as mute and emotionless as ever, seven crewmen climbed onto the platform. "'One carried a harpoon and line similar to those used in whale-fishing. "'Its deck paneling opened. The skiff was wrenched from its socket and launched to sea. Six rowers sat on the thwarts, and the coxswains took the tiller. "'Ned, Conseil, and I found seats in the stern. "'Aren't you coming, Captain?' I asked. "'No, sir, but I wish you happy hunting.' The skiff pulled clear, and carried off by its six oars, it headed swiftly toward the dugong, which by then was floating two miles from the Nautilus. Arriving within a few cable lengths of the cetacean, our longboat slowed down, and the skulls dipped noiselessly into the tranquil waters. Harpoon in hand, Ned Land went to take his stand in the skiff's bow. Harpoons used for hunting whales are usually attached to a very long rope that pays out quickly when the wounded animal drags it with him, but this rope measured no more than about ten fathoms, and its end had simply been fastened to a small barrel that, while floating, would indicate the dugong's movements beneath the waters. I stood up and could clearly observe the Canadian's adversary. This dugong, which also boasts the name Halicor, closely resembled a manatee. Its oblong body ended in a very long caudal fin, and its lateral fins in actual fingers. It differs from the manatee in that its upper jaw is armed with two long, pointed teeth that form diverging tusks on either side. This dugong that Ned Land was preparing to attack was of colossal dimensions, easily exceeding seven meters in length. It didn't stir and seemed to be sleeping on the surface of the waves, a circumstance that should have made it easier to capture. The skiff approached cautiously to within three fathoms of the animal. The oars hung suspended above their rowlocks. I was crouching, his body leaning slightly back. Ned Land brandished his harpoon with expert hands. Suddenly a hissing sound was audible, and the dugong disappeared. Although the harpoon had been forcefully hurled, it apparently had hit only water. "'Damnation!' exclaimed the furious Canadian. "'I missed it!' "'No,' I said. "'The animal's wounded. There's its blood. But your weapon didn't stick in its body.' "'My harpoon! Get my harpoon!' Ned Land exclaimed. The sailors went back to their sculling, and the coxswain steered the longboat towards the floating barrel. We fished up the harpoon, and the skiff started off in pursuit of the animal. The latter returned from time to time to breathe at the surface of the sea. Its wound hadn't weakened it, because it went with tremendous speed. Driven by energetic arms, the longboat flew on its trail. Several times we got within a few fathoms of it, and the Canadian hovered in readiness to strike. But then the dugong would steal away with a sudden dive, and it proved impossible to overtake the beast. I'll let you assess the degree of anger consuming our impatient Ned Land. He hurled at the hapless animal the most potent swear words in the English language— for my part, I was simply distressed to see this dugong outwit our every scheme. We chased it unflailingly for a full hour, and I'd begun to think it would prove too difficult to capture, when the animal got the untimely idea of taking revenge on us, a notion it would soon have caused to regret. It wheeled on the skiff to assault us in its turn. This maneuver did not escape the Canadian. "'Watch out!' he said. The coxswain pronounced a few words in his bizarre language, and no doubt he alerted his men to keep on their guard." Arriving within twenty feet of the skiff, the dugong stopped sharply, sniffing the air with its huge nostrils, pierced not at the tip of its muzzle, but on its top side. Then it gathered itself and sprang at us. The skiff couldn't avoid the collision. Half overturned, it shipped a ton or two of water that we had to bail out, but thanks to our skillful coxswain, we were fouled on the bias rather than broadside, so we didn't capsize. 
Clinging to the stem post, Ned Land thrust his harpoon again and again into the gigantic animal, which embedded its teeth in our gunwale and lifted the longboat out of the water as a lion would lift a deer. We were thrown on top of each other, and I have no idea how the venture would have ended had not the Canadian, still thirsting for the beast's blood, finally pierced it to the heart. I heard its teeth grind on sheet iron, and the dugong disappeared, taking our harpoon along with it. But the barrel soon popped up on the surface, and a few moments later the animal's body appeared and rolled over on its back. Our skiff rejoined it, took it in a tow, and headed to the Nautilus. It took pulleys of great strength to hoist this dugong onto the platform. The beast weighed five thousand kilograms. It was carved up in sight of the Canadian, who remained to watch every detail of the operation. At dinner the same day, my steward served me some slices of this flesh, skillfully dressed by the ship's cook. I found it excellent, even better than veal, if not beef. The next morning, February 11, the Nautilus's pantry was enriched by more dainty game. A covey of terns alighted on the Nautilus. They were a species of Sterna nilotica, unique to Egypt. Beak black, head gray, and stipled, eyes surrounded by white dots, black wings, and tail grayish. Belly and throat white, feet red. Also caught were a couple dozen Nile duck, superior tasting wild fowl, whose neck and crown of the head are white speckled with black. By then the Nautilus had reduced speed. It moved ahead at a saunter, so to speak. I observed that the Red Sea's water was becoming less salty the closer we got to Suez. Near five o'clock in the afternoon we sighted Cape Ras Mohammed to the north. This cape forms the tip of Arabia Petraea, which lies between the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. The Nautilus entered the Strait of Jubal, which leads to the Gulf of Suez. I could clearly make out a high mountain crowning Ras Mohammed between the two gulfs. It was Mount Horeb, that biblical Mount Sinai in whose summit Moses met God face to face, that summit the mind's eye always pictures as wreathed in lightning. At six o'clock, sometimes afloat and sometimes submerged, the Nautilus passed well out from El Tor, which sat at the far end of a bay, whose waters seemed to be dyed red, as Captain Nemo had already mentioned. Then night fell in the midst of a heavy silence, occasionally broken by the calls of pelicans and nocturnal birds, by the sound of surf chafing against rocks, or by the distant moan of a steamer churning the waves of the gulf with noisy blades. From eight to nine o'clock the Nautilus stayed a few meters beneath the waters. According to my calculations, we had to be quite close to Suez. Through the panels in the lounge I spotted rocky bottoms brightly lit by our electric rays. It seemed to me that the strait was getting narrower and narrower. At 9.15, when our boat returned to the surface, I climbed onto the platform. I was quite impatient to clear Captain Nemo's tunnel, couldn't sit still, and wanted to breathe the fresh night air. Soon in the shadows I spotted a pale signal light glimmering a mile away, half discolored by mist. "'A floating lighthouse,' said someone next to me. I turned and discovered the captain." "'That's the floating signal light of Suez,' he went on. "'It won't be long before we reach the entrance to the tunnel. "'It can't be very easy to enter it.' "'No, sir. Accordingly, I'm in the habit of staying in the pilot-house and directing maneuvers myself. "'And now, if you'll kindly go below, Professor Aronnax, the Nautilus is about to sink beneath the waves, "'and it will only return to the surface after we've cleared the Arabian Tunnel.' "'I followed Captain Nemo. The hatch closed, the ballast tanks filled with water, and the submersible sank some ten meters down. Just as I was about to repair to my stateroom, the captain stopped me. "'Professor,' he said to me, "'would you like to go with me to the wheelhouse?' "'I was afraid to ask,' I replied. "'Come along, then. This way you'll learn the full story about this combination under water and underground navigating.' Captain Nemo led me to the central companionway. In mid-stair he opened a door, went along the upper gangway, and arrived at the wheelhouse, which, as you know, stands at one end of the platform. It was a cabin measuring six feet square, and closely resembling those occupied by the helmsmen of steamboats on the Mississippi or Hudson Rivers. In the center stood an upright wheel, gearing to rudder cables running to the Nautilus's stern. Set in the captain's walls were four dead lights, windows of biconvex glass that enabled the man at the helm to see in every direction. The cabin was dark, but my eyes soon grew accustomed to its darkness, and I saw the pilot, a muscular man whose hands rested on the pegs of the wheel. Outside, the sea was brightly lit by the beacon shining behind the captain at the other end of the platform. Now, Captain Nemo said, let's look for our passageway. 
electric wires linked to the pilot house with the engine room and from this cabin the captain could simultaneously signal heading and speed to his nautilus he pressed a metal button and at once the propeller slowed down significantly i stared in silence at the high sheer wall we were skirting just then the firm base of the sandy mountains on the coast for an hour we went along in this fashion staying only a few meters away Captain Nemo never took his eyes off the two concentric circles of the compass hanging in the cabin. At a mere gesture from him, the helmsman would instantly change the Nautilus's heading. Standing by the port deadlight, I spotted magnificent coral substructures, zoophytes, algae, and crustaceans with enormous quivering claws that stretched forth from crevices in the rock. At 10.15, Captain Nemo himself took the helm. Dark and deep, a wide gallery opened ahead of us. The Nautilus was brazenly swallowed up. Strange rumblings were audible along our sides. It was the water of the Red Sea hurled towards the Mediterranean by the tunnel's slope. Our engines tried to offer resistance by churning the waves with propeller in reverse, but the Nautilus went with the torrent as swift as an arrow. Along the narrow walls of this passageway I saw only brilliant streaks, hard lines, fiery furrows, all scrawled by our speeding electric light. With my hand I tried to curb the pounding of my heart. At 10.35 Captain Nemo left the steering wheel and turned to me. The Mediterranean, he told me. In less than twenty minutes, swept along by the torrent, the Nautilus had just cleared the Isthmus of Suez. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 The Greek Islands At sunrise the next morning, February 12, the Nautilus rose to the surface of the waves. I rushed out onto the platform. The hazy silhouette of Pelusium was outlined three miles to the south. A torrent had carried us from one sea to the other. But although that tunnel was easy to descend, going back up it must have been impossible. Near seven o'clock, Ned and Conseil joined me. Those two inseparable companions had slept serenely, utterly unaware of the Nautilus's feet. "'Well, Mr. Naturalist,' the Canadian asked in a gently mocking tone, "'and how about that Mediterranean?' "'We're floating on its surface, Ned, my friend.' "'What?' Conseil put in. "'Last night?' "'Yes, last night, in a matter of minutes, we cleared that unsuperable isthmus.' "'I don't believe a word of it,' the Canadian replied." "'And you're in the wrong, Mr. Land,' I went on. "'That flat coastline curving southward is the coast of Egypt.' "'Tell it to the Marines, sir,' answered the stubborn Canadian. "'But if Master says so,' Conseil told him, "'then so be it.' "'What's more, Ned?' I said. "'Captain Nemo himself did the honors in his tunnel, "'and I stood beside him in the pilot-house "'while he steered the Nautilus through that narrow passageway.' "'You hear, Ned?' Conseil said. "'And you, Ned, who have such good eyes,' I added. "'You can spot the jetties of Port Said stretching out to sea.' The Canadian looked carefully. "'Correct,' he said. "'You're right, Professor, and your captain's a superman. We're in the Mediterranean. Fine. So now let's have a chat about our little doings, if you please, but in such a way that nobody overhears.' I could easily see what the Canadian was driving at. In any event, I thought it best to let him have his chat, and we all three went to sit next to the beacon, where we were less exposed to the damp spray from the billows. "'Now, Ned, we're all ears,' I said. "'What have you to tell us?' "'What I've got to tell you is very simple,' the Canadian replied. "'We're in Europe, and before Captain Nemo's whim takes us deep into the polar seas or back to Oceania, I say we should leave this Nautilus.' I confess that such discussions with the Canadian always baffled me. I didn't want to restrict my companion's freedom in any way, and yet I had no desire to leave Captain Nemo. Thanks to him and his submersible, I was finishing my undersea research by the day, and I was rewriting my book on the great ocean depths in the midst of its very element. Would I ever again have such an opportunity to observe the ocean's wonders? Absolutely not! So I couldn't entertain this idea of leaving the Nautilus before completing our course of inquiry. "'Ned, my friend,' I said, "'answer me honestly. Are you bored with this ship? Are you sorry that fate has cast you into Captain Nemo's hands?' The Canadian paused for a short while before replying, then crossing his arms. "'Honestly,' he said, "'I'm not sorry about this voyage under the seas. I'll be glad to have done with it, but in order to have done with it it has to finish. That's my feeling.' "'It will finish, Ned.' "'Where and when?' 
where i don't know when i can't say or rather i suppose it will be over when these seas have nothing more to teach us everything that begins in this world must inevitably come to an end i think as master does conseil replied and it's extremely possible that after crossing every sea on the globe captain nemo will bid the three of us a fond farewell bid us a fond farewell the canadian exclaimed you mean beat us to a fare thee well let's not exaggerate mr land i went on we have nothing to fear from the captain but neither do i share conseil's view we're privy to the nautilus's secrets and i don't expect that its commander just to set us free will meekly stand by while we spread those secrets all over the world but in that case what do you expect the canadian asked that we'll encounter advantageous conditions for escaping just as readily in six months as now great scott ned land put in and where if you please will we be in six months mr naturalist perhaps here perhaps in china you know how quickly the nautilus moves it crosses oceans like swallows cross the air or express trains continents it doesn't fear heavily traveled seas who can say it won't hug the coast of france england or america where an escape attempt could be carried out just as effectively as here professor anorax the canadian replied your arguments are rotten to the core you talk way off in the future we'll be here we'll be there me talking about right now we are here and we must take advantage of it i was hard pressed by ned land's common sense and i felt myself losing ground i no longer knew what arguments to put forward on my behalf sir ned went on let's suppose that by some impossibility captain nemo offered your freedom to you this very day would you accept i don't know i replied and suppose he adds that this offer he's making you today won't ever be repeated then would you accept i did not reply and what thinks our friend conseil ned land asked your friend conseil the fine lad replied serenely has nothing to say for himself he's a completely disinterested party on this question like his master like his comrade ned he's a bachelor neither wife parents nor children are waiting for him back home he's in master's employ he thinks like master he speaks like master and much to his regret he can't be counted on to form a majority only two persons face each other here master on one side ned land on the other that said your friend conseil is listening and he's ready to keep score i couldn't help smiling as conseil wiped himself out of existence deep down the canadian must have been overjoyed at not having to contend with him then sir ned land said since conseil is no more we'll have this discussion between just the two of us i've talked you've listened what's your reply it was obvious that the matter had to be settled and evasions were distasteful to me ned my friend i said here's my reply you have right on your side and my arguments can't stand up to yours it will never do to count on captain nemo's benevolence the most ordinary good sense would forbid him to set us free on the other hand good sense decrees that we take advantage of our first opportunity to live the nautilus fine professor aronnax that's wisely said but one proviso i said just one the opportunity must be the real thing our first attempt to escape must succeed because if it misfires we won't get a second chance and captain nemo will never forgive us that's also well put the canadian replied but your proviso applies to any escape attempt whether it happens in two years or two days so this is still the question if a promising opportunity comes up we have to grab it agreed and now ned will you tell me what you mean by a promising opportunity one that leads the nautilus on a cloudy night within a short distance of some european coast and you'll try to get away by swimming yes if we're close enough to shore and the ships afloat on the surface no if we're well out and the ships navigating under the waters and in that event in that event i'll try to get hold of the skiff i know how to handle it we'll stick ourselves inside undo the bolts and rise to the surface without the helmsman in the bow seeing a thing fine ned stay on the lookout for such an opportunity but don't forget one slip up will finish us i won't forget sir and now ned would you like to know my overall thinking on your plan gladly professor aronnax well then i think and i don't mean i hope that your promising opportunity won't ever arise why not because captain nemo recognizes that we haven't given up all hope of recovering our freedom and he'll keep on his guard above all in seas within sight of the coast of europe i'm of master's opinion conseil said we'll soon see ned land replied shaking his head with a determined expression 
And now, Ned Land, I added, let's leave it at that. Not another word on any of this. The day you're ready, alert us, and we're with you. I turn it all over to you. That's how we ended this conversation, which later was to have such serious consequences. At first, I must say, events seemed to confirm my forecast, much to the Canadian's despair. Did Captain Nemo view us with distrust in these heavily travelled seas, or did he simply want to hide from the sight of those ships of every nation that ploughed the Mediterranean? I have no idea, but usually he stayed in mid-water, and well out from any coast. Either the Nautilus surfaced only enough to let its pilot-house emerge, or it slipped away to the lower depths, although between the Greek islands and Asia Minor we didn't find bottom even at two thousand meters down. Accordingly, I became aware of the Isle of Carpathos, one of the Sporades Islands, only when Captain Nemo placed his finger over a spot on the world map and quoted me this verse from Virgil. Est in Carpathio Neptuni Gorgite Vates. Carulius Proteus. It was indeed that bygone abode of Proteus, that old shepherd of King Neptune's flock, an island located between Rhodes and Crete, which Greeks now call Carpathos, Italians Scarpanto. Through the lounge window I could see only its granite bedrock. The next day, February 14, I decided to spend a few hours studying the fish of this island group, but for whatever reason the panels remained hermetically sealed. After determining the Nautilus's heading, I noted that it was proceeding toward the ancient island of Crete, also called Candia. At the time I had shipped aboard the Abraham Lincoln, this whole island was in rebellion against its tyrannical rulers, the Ottoman Empire of Turkey. But since then I had absolutely no idea what happened to this revolution, and Captain Nemo, deprived of all contact with the shore, was hardly the man to keep me informed. So I didn't allude to this event when, that evening, I chanced to be alone with the captain in the lounge. Besides, he seemed silent and preoccupied. Then, contrary to custom, he ordered that both panels in the lounge be opened, and going from the one to the other, he carefully observed the watery mass. For what purpose? I hadn't to guess, and for my part I spent my time studying the fish that passed before my eyes. Among others, I noted that sand goby mentioned by Aristotle, and commonly known by the name sea loach, which is encountered exclusively in the salty waters next to the Nile Delta. Near them, some semi-phosphorescent red porgy rolled by, a variety of gilt head that the Egyptians ranked among their sacred animals, lauding them in religious ceremonies when their arrival in the river's waters announced the fertile flood season. I also noticed some race known as the tapiro, three decimeters long, bony fish with transparent scales, whose bluish-gray color is mixed with red spots. They're enthusiastic eaters of marine vegetables, which gives them an exquisite flavor. Hence these tapiro were much in demand by the epicures of ancient Rome, and their entrails were dressed with brains of peacock, tongue of flamingo, and testes of moray, to make that divine platter that so enraptured the Roman emperor Vitilius. Another resident of these seas caught my attention, and revived all my memories of antiquity. This was the remora, which travels attached to the bellies of sharks. As the ancients tell it, when these little fish cling to the undersides of a ship, they can bring it to a halt, and by so impending mark Antony's vessel during the Battle of Actium. One of them facilitated the victory of Augustus Caesar. From such slender threads hang the destinies of nations. I also observed some wonderful snappers belonging to the order Lutianida, sacred fish for the Greeks, who claimed they could drive off sea monsters from the waters they frequent. Their Greek name, Antheus, means flower, and they live up to it in the play of their colors and in those fleeting reflections that turn their dorsal fins into watered silk. Their hues are confined to a gamut of red, from the paler of pink to the glow of ruby. I couldn't take my eyes off these marine wonders when I was suddenly jolted by an unexpected apparition. In the midst of the waters a man appeared, a diver carrying a little leather bag at his belt. It was no corpse lost in the waves. It was a living man, swimming vigorously, sometimes disappearing to breathe at the surface, then instantly diving again. I turned to Captain Nemo, and in an agitated voice, "'A man! A castaway!' I exclaimed. "'We must rescue him at all cost!' The captain didn't reply, but went to lean against the window. The man drew near, and gluing his face to the panel, he stared at us. To my deep astonishment, Captain Nemo gave him a signal. 
The diver answered with his hand, immediately swam up to the surface of the sea, and didn't reappear. "'Don't be alarmed,' the captain told me. "'That's Nicholas from Cape Metapin, nicknamed Il Pesci, for the fish. He's well known throughout the Cyclades Island. A bold diver. Water is his true element, and he lives in the sea more than on shore, going constantly from one island to the other, even to Crete. "'You know him, Captain?' "'Why not, Professor Aronnax?' This said, Captain Nemo went to a cabinet staring near the lounge's left panel. Next to this cabinet I saw a chest bound with hoops of iron, its lid bearing a copper plaque that displayed the Nautilus's monogram with its motto, Mobilis in mobili. Just then, ignoring my presence, the captain opened this cabinet, a sort of safe that contained a large number of ingots. They were gold ingots, and they represented an enormous sum of money. Where had this precious metal come from? How had the captain amassed this gold, and what was he about to do with it? I didn't pronounce a word. I gaped. Captain Nemo took out the ingots one by one and arranged them methodically inside the chest, filling it to the top, at which point I estimate that it held more than one thousand kilograms of gold, in other words, close to five million French francs. After securely fastening the chest, Captain Nemo wrote an address on its lid in characters that must have been modern Greek. This done, the captain pressed a button whose wiring was in communication with the crew's quarters. Four men appeared, and not without difficulty pushed the chest out of the lounge. Then I heard them hoisted up the iron companionway by means of pulleys. Just then Captain Nemo turned to me. "'You were saying, Professor?' he asked me. "'I wasn't saying a thing, Captain.' Then, sir, with your permission, I will bid you good evening. And with that, Captain Nemo left the lounge. I re-entered my stateroom, very puzzled, as you can imagine. I tried in vain to fall asleep. I kept searching for a relationship between the appearance of the diver and that chest filled with gold. Soon, from certain rolling and pitching movements, I sensed that the Nautilus had left the lower strata and was back on the surface of the water. Then I heard the sound of footsteps on the platform. I realized that the skiff was being detached and launched to sea. For an instant it bumped the Nautilus aside. Then all sounds ceased. Two hours later the same noises, the same comings and goings, were repeated. Hoisted on board, the longboat was readjusted into its sockets, and the Nautilus plunged back beneath the waves. So those millions had been delivered to their address. At what spot on the continent? Who was the recipient of Captain Nemo's gold? The next day I related the night's events to Conseil and the Canadian, events that had aroused my curiosity to a fever pitch. My companions were as startled as I was. "'But where does he get those millions?' Ned Land asked. To this no reply was possible. After breakfast I made my way to the lounge and went about my work. I wrote up my notes until five o'clock in the afternoon. Just then, was it due to some personal indisposition, I felt extremely hot and had to take off my jacket made of fan-muscle fabric." a perplexing circumstance, because we weren't in the low latitudes, and besides, once the Nautilus was submerged, it shouldn't be subject to any rise in temperature. I looked at the pressure gauge. It marked a depth of sixty feet, a depth beyond the reach of atmospheric heat. I kept on working, but the temperature rose to the point of becoming unbearable. Could there be a fire on board, I wondered? I was about to leave the lounge when Captain Nemo entered. He approached the thermometer, consulted it, and turned to me. Forty-two degrees centigrade,' he said. "'I've detected as much, Captain,' I replied. "'And if it gets even slightly hotter, we won't be able to stand it.' "'Oh, Professor, it won't get any hotter unless we want it to.' "'You mean you can control this heat?' "'No, but I can back away from the fireplace producing it.' "'So it's outside?' "'Surely. We're cruising in a current of boiling water.' "'It can't be!' I exclaimed. "'Look!' The panels had opened, and I could see a completely white sea around the Nautilus. Steaming sulfurous fumes uncoiled in the midst of waves, bubbling like water in a boiler. I leaned my hand against one of the windows, but the heat was so great I had to snatch it back. "'Where are we?' I asked. "'Near the island of Santorini, Professor,' the captain answered me. "'And right in the channel that separates the volcanic islets of Nia Kameni and Pelea Kameni. I wanted to offer you the unusual sight of an underwater eruption.' I thought, I said, that the formation of such new islands had come to an end. 
"'Nothing ever comes to an end in these volcanic waterways,' Captain Nemo replied. "'And thanks to its underground fires, our globe is continuously under construction in these regions.' According to the Latin historians Cassiodorus and Pliny, by the year 19 of the Christian era, a new island, the divine Thera, had already appeared in the very place these inlets have more recently formed. Then Thera sank under the waves, only to rise and sink once more in the year 69 A.D. From that day to this, such plutonic construction work has been in abeyance. But on February 3, 1866, a new islet named George Island merged in the midst of sulfurous steam near Nea Kameni, and was fused to it on the 6th of the same month. Seven days later, on February 13, the islet of Afroesa appeared, leaving a ten-meter channel between itself and Nea Kameni. I was in these seas when that phenomenon occurred, and I was able to assert its very phase. The islet of Afroesa was circular in shape, measuring three hundred feet in diameter and thirty feet in height. It was made of black glassy lava mixed with bits of feldspar. Finally, on March 10, a smaller islet called Reca appeared next to Nea Kameni, and since then these three islets have fused to form one single self-same island. What about this channel we're in right now? I asked. Here it is, Captain Nemo replied, showing me a chart of the Greek islands. You observe that I've entered the new islet in their place. But will this channel fill up one day? Very likely, Professor Aranax, because since 1866, eight little lava islets have surged up in front of the port of St. Nicholas on Pelea Kameni. So it's obvious that Nea and Pelea will join in days to come. In the middle of the Pacific, tiny infusiora build continents, but here they're built by volcanic phenomena. Look, sir, look at the construction work going on under these waves. I returned to the window. The Nautilus was no longer moving. The heat had become unbearable. From the white it had recently been, the sea was turning red, a coloration caused by the presence of iron salts. Although the lounge was hermetically sealed, it was filling with intolerable stink of sulfur, and I could see scarlet flames of such brightness they overpowered our electric light. I was swimming in perspiration. I was stifling. I was about to be cooked. Yes, I felt myself cooking in actual fact. We can't stay any longer in this boiling water, I told the captain. No, it wouldn't be advisable, replied Nemo, the emotionalist. He gave an order. The Nautilus tacked about and retreated from this furnace. It couldn't brave with impunity. A quarter of an hour later, we were breathing fresh air on the surface of the waves. It then occurred to me that if Ned had chosen these waterways for our escape attempt— we wouldn't have come out alive from this sea of fire. The next day, February 16, we left this basin, which tallies depths of 3,000 meters between Rhodes and Alexandria, and passing well out from Cerijo Island, after doubling Cape Matapan, the Nautilus left the Greek islands behind. End of Part 2, Chapter 6 Chapter 7 the Mediterranean in 48 hours. The Mediterranean, your ideal blue sea. To Greeks, simply the sea. To Hebrews, the great sea. To Romans, Mare Nostrum, bordered by orange trees, aloes, cactus, and maritime pine trees, perfumed with the scent of myrtle, framed by rugged mountains, saturated with clean, transparent air, but continuously under construction by fires in the earth, this sea is a genuine battlefield where Neptune and Pluto still struggle for world domination. Here on these beaches and waters, says the French historian Michelet, a man is revived by one of the most invigorating climates in the world. But as beautiful as it was, I could get only a quick look at this basin whose surface area comprises two million square kilometers. Even Captain Nemo's personal insights were denied me because that mystifying individual didn't appear one single time during our high-speed crossing. I estimate that the Nautilus covered a track of some 600 leagues under the waves of this sea, and this voyage was accomplished in just 24 hours times two. Departing from the waterways of Greece on the morning of February 16th, we cleared the Strait of Gibraltar by sunrise on the 18th. It was obvious to me that this Mediterranean, pinned in the middle of those shores he wanted to avoid, gave Captain Nemo no pleasure. Its waves and breezes brought back too many memories, if not too many regrets. 
Here he no longer had the ease of movement and freedom of maneuver that the oceans allowed him, and his nautilus felt cramped so close to the coasts of both Africa and Europe. Accordingly, our speed was twenty-five miles, that is, twelve four-kilometer leagues, per hour. Needless to say, Ned Land had to give up his escape plans, much to his distress. Swept along at the rate of twelve to thirteen meters per second, he could hardly make use of the skiff. Leaving the Nautilus under these conditions would have been like jumping off a train racing at this speed, a rash move if there ever was one. Moreover, to renew our air supply, the submersible rose to the surface of the waves only at night, and, relying solely on compass and log, it steered by dead reckoning. Inside the Mediterranean, then, I could catch no more of its fast-passing scenery than a traveler might see from an express train. In other words, I could view only the distant horizons because the foregrounds flashed by like lightning. But Conciol and I were able to observe those Mediterranean fish whose powerful fins kept pace for a while in the Nautilus's waters. We stayed on watch before the lounge windows, and our notes enable me to reconstruct, in a few words, the ichthyology of this sea. Among the various fish inhabiting it, some I viewed, others I glimpsed, and the rest I missed completely because of the Nautilus's speed. Kindly allow me to sort them out using this whimsical system of classification. It will, at least, convey the quickness of my observations. In the midst of the watery mass, brightly lit by our electric beams, there snaked past those one-meter lampreys that are common to nearly every clime. A type of ray from the genus Oxyrhynchus, five feet wide, had a white belly with a spotted, ash-gray back, and was carried along by the currents like a huge, wide-open shoal. Other rays passed by so quickly, I couldn't tell if they deserved that name Eagle Ray, coined by the ancient Greeks, or those designations of Rat Ray, Bat Ray, and Toad Ray that modern fishermen have inflicted on them. Dogfish, known as topes, twelve feet long and especially feared by divers, were racing with each other. Looking like big bluish shadows, thresher sharks went by, eight feet long, and gifted with an extremely acute sense of spell. Dorados, from the genus Sparus, some measuring up to thirteen decimeters, appeared in silver and azure costumes encircled with ribbons, which contrasted with the dark color of their fins. Fish sacred to the goddess Venus, their eyes set in brows of gold, a valuable species that patronizes all waters, fresh or salt, equally at home in rivers, lakes, and oceans, living in every clime, tolerating any temperature, their line dating back to prehistoric times on this earth, yet preserving all its beauty from those far-off days. Magnificent sturgeons, nine to ten meters long and extremely fast, banged their powerful tails against the glass of our panels, showing bluish backs with small brown spots. They resemble sharks without equaling their strength and are encountered in every sea. In the spring, they delight in swimming up the great rivers, fighting the currents of the Volga, Danube, Po, Rhine, Loire, and Oder, while feeding on herring, mackerel, salmon, and codfish. Although they belong to the class of cartilaginous fish, they rate as a delicacy. They are eaten fresh, dried, marinated, or salt-preserved, and in olden times they were borne in triumph to the table of the Roman epicure Lucilius. But whenever the Nautilus drew near the surface, those denizens of the Mediterranean I could observe most productively belonged to the 63rd genus of bony fish. These were tuna from the genus Scomber, blue-black on top, silver on the belly armor, their dorsal stripes giving off a golden gleam. They are said to follow ships in search of refreshing shade from the hot tropical sun, and they did just that with the Nautilus, as they had once done with the vessels of the Count de la Perros. For long hours they competed in speeds with our submersible. I couldn't stop marveling at these animals so perfectly cut out for racing, their heads small, their bodies sleek, spindle-shaped, and in some cases over three meters long, their pectoral fins gifted with remarkable strength, their caudal fins forked. Like certain flocks of birds, whose speed they equal, these tuna swim in triangle formation, which prompted the ancients to say they'd boned up on geometry and military strategy. And yet they can't escape the provincial fishermen, who prize them as highly as did the ancient inhabitants of Turkey and Italy. And these valuable animals, as oblivious as if they were deaf and blind, leapt right into the Marseilles tuna nets and perished by the thousands. Just for the record, I'll mention those Mediterranean fish that Conciol and I barely glimpsed. They were whitish eels of the species Gymnotus fasciatus that passed like elusive wisps of steam, conger eels three to four meters long that were tricked out in green, blue, and yellow, 
three foot hake with a liver that makes a dainty morsel, worm fish drifting like thin seaweed, sea robins that poets call lyrefish, and semen pipers, and whose snouts have two jagged triangular plates shaped like old Homer's lyre, swallow fish swimming as fast as the bird they're named after, red headed groupers whose dorsal fins are trimmed with filaments, some shad spotted with black, gray, brown, blue, yellow, and green that actually responded to tinkling handbells, splendid diamond-shaped turbot that were like aquatic pheasants with yellowish fins stripled in brown and the left top side mostly marbled in brown and yellow, finally schools of wonderful red mullet, real oceanic birds of paradise that ancient Romans bought for as much as ten thousand sesterces apiece, and which they killed at the table, so that they could heartlessly watch it change color from cinnabar red when alive to pallid white when dead. And as for other fish common to the Atlantic and Mediterranean, I was unable to observe mirelets, triggerfish, puffers, seahorses, jewelfish, trumpetfish, blennies, grey mullet, rasse, smelt, flying fish, anchovies, sea bream, porgies, garfish, or any of the chief representatives of the order Pluraronecta, such as sole, flounder, palace, dab, and brill, simply because of the dizzying speed with which the Nautilus hustled through these opulent waters. As for marine mammals, on passing by the mouth of the Adriatic Sea, I thought I recognized two or three sperm whales, equipped with a single dorsal fin denoting the genus Fester. Some pilot whales from the genus Globus of Alice, exclusive to the Mediterranean, the forepart of the head striped with small, distinct lines, and also a dozen seals with white bellies and black coats, known by the name monk seals, and just as solemn as if they were three-meter Dominicans. For his part, Conciol thought he spotted a turtle six feet wide, and adorned with three protruding ridges that ran lengthwise. I was sorry to miss this reptile, because, from Conciol's description, I believe I recognized the leatherback turtle, a pretty rare species. For my part, I noted only some loggerhead turtles with long carapaces. As for zoophytes, for a few moments I was able to marvel at a wonderful orange-hued hydra from the genus Gallolaria that clung to the glass of our port panel. It consisted of a long, lean filament that spread out into countless branches and ended in the most delicate lace ever spun by the followers of Arachne. Unfortunately, I couldn't fish up this wonderful specimen, and surely no other Mediterranean zoophytes would have been offered to my gaze if, on the evening of the 16th, the Nautilus hadn't slowed down in an odd fashion. This was the situation. By then we were passing between Sicily and the coast of Tunisia. In the cramped space between Cape Bon and the Strait of Messina, the sea bottom rises almost at once. It forms an actual ridge with only 17 meters of water remaining above it, while the depth on either side is 170 meters. Consequently, the Nautilus had to maneuver with caution so as not to bump into this underwater barrier. I showed Conciol the position of this long reef on our chart of the Mediterranean. But with all due respect to Master, Conciol ventured to observe, it's like an actual isthmus connecting Europe to Africa. Yes, my boy, I replied, it cuts across the whole strait of Sicily, and Smith's soundings prove that in the past these two continents were genuinely connected between Cape Bio and Cape Farina. I can easily believe it, Conciol said. I might add, I went on, that there is a similar barrier between Gibraltar and Ceuta, and in prehistoric times it closed off the Mediterranean completely. Gracious, Conseil put in, suppose one day some volcanic upheaval raises these two barriers back above the waves. That's most unlikely, Conseil. If Master will allow me to finish, I mean that if this phenomenon occurs, it might prove distressing to Mr. Le La Sapes, who has gone to such pains to cut through his isthmus. Agreed, but I repeat, Conseil, such a phenomenon won't occur. The intensity of these underground forces continues to diminish. Volcanoes were quite numerous in the world's early days, but they're going extinct one by one. The heat inside the earth is growing weaker. The temperature in the globe's lower strata is cooling appreciably every century, and to our globe's detriment, because its heat is its life. But the sun, the sun isn't enough, Conseil. Can it restore heat to a corpse? Not that I have heard. Well, my friend, some day the earth will be just such a cold corpse, like the moon, which long ago lost its vital heat. Our globe will become lifeless and unlivable. In how many centuries? Conseil asked. In hundreds of thousands of years, my boy. Then we have ample time to finish our voyage, Conseil replied, if Ned Land doesn't mess things up. Thus reassured, 
Conseil went back to studying the shallows that the Nautilus was skimming at moderate speed. On the rocky volcanic sea floor, there boomed quite a collection of moving flora. Sponges, sea cucumbers, jellyfish called sea gooseberries that were adorned with reddish tendrils and gave off a subtle phosphorescence, members of the genus Biro that are commonly known by the name melon jellyfish and are bathed in the shimmer of the whole solar spectrum, free swimming crinoids one meter wide that redden the waters with their crimson hue, tree-like basket stars of the greatest beauty, sea fans from the genus Pavonacea with long stems, numerous edible sea urchins of various species, plus green sea anemones with a grayish trunk and a brown disc lost beneath the olive-colored tresses of their tentacles. Conseil kept especially busy observing mollusks and articulates, and although his catalogue is a little dry, I wouldn't want to wrong the gallant lad by leaving out his personal observations. From the branch mollusca, he mentions numerous comb-shaped scallops, hoof-like spiny oysters piled on top of each other, triangular coquina, three-pronged glass snails with yellow fins and transparent shells, orange snails from the genus Plurobracus that looked like eggs spotted or speckled with greenish dots, members of the genus Aplysia, also known by the name sea hares, other sea hares from the genus Dolabella, plump paper bubble shells, umbrella shells exclusive to the Mediterranean, abalone, whose shell produces a mother of pearl much in demand, pilgrim scallops, saddle shells that divers in the French province of Languedoc are said to like better than oysters, some of those cockle shells so dear to the citizens of Marseilles, fat white Venus shells that are among the clams so abundant off the coasts of North America and eaten in such quantities by New Yorkers, variously colored comb shells with gill covers, burrowing date mussels with a peppery flavor I relish, furrowed heart cockles, whose shells have rib-like ridges on their arching summits, triton shells pocked with scarlet bumps, carnioria snails with backward curving tips that make them resemble flimsy gondolas, crowned ferrola snails, atlantis snails with spiral shells, gray nudibrochs from the genus tethys that were spotted with white and covered by fringed mantles, nudibrochs from the suborder eolida that looked like small slugs, sea butterflies crawling on their backs, seashells from the genus auricula, including the oval-shaped Aricula marostosis, tan, wentle trap snails, common periwinkles, violet snails, seen rarera snails, rock borers, ear shales, capuchin shales, pandora shales, etc. As for the articulates, in his notes, Conseil has very appropriately divided them into six classes, three of which belong to the marine world. These classes are the crustacea, cirripida, and annelida. Crustaceans are subdivided into nine orders, and the first of these consists of the decapods, in other words, animals whose head and thorax are usually fused, whose cheek and mouth mechanism is made up of several pairs of appendages, and whose thorax has four, five, or six pairs of walking legs. Conciol used the methods of our mentor, Professor Milne Edwards, who puts the decapods in three divisions, Brachiora, Machiora, and Anomiora. These names may look a tad fierce, but they are accurate and appropriate. Among the Brachthura, Conseil mentioned some Amanthia crabs whose fronts were armed with two big diverging tips, those Incas scorpions that, Lord knows why, symbolized wisdom to the ancient Greeks, spider crabs of the Manassa and Spiname varieties that had probably gone astray in these shallows because they usually lived in the lower depths, Xanthed crabs, Pilumina crabs, Rhomboid crabs, granular box crabs, easy on their digestion, as Conseil ventured to observe, toothless mask crabs, Ibalia crabs, Cymopolia crabs, woolly-handed crabs, etc. Among the Macura, which are subdivided into five families, hard shells, burrowers, crayfish, prawns, and ghost crabs, Conseil mentions some common spiny lobsters whose females supply a meat highly prized, slipper lobsters or common shrimp, waterside gavia shrimp, and all sorts of edible species, but he says nothing of the crayfish subdivision that includes the true lobster, because spiny lobsters are the only type in the Mediterranean. Finally, among the Anomura, he saw common Droxina crabs dwelling inside whatever abandoned seashells they could take over, Homola crabs with spiny fronts, hermit crabs, hairy porcelain crabs, etc. There, Conseil's work came to a halt. He didn't have time to finish off the class Crustacea through an examination of its stomatopods, amphipods, homopods, isopods, trilobites, branchiopods, ostracods, 
and Entromosacian, and in order to complete his study of the marine articulates, he needed to mention the class Cetapida, which contains water fleas and carp lice, plus the class Analida, which he would have divided without fail into tubifex worms and dorsobrachian worms. But, having gone past the shallows of the Strait of Sicily, the Nautilus resumed its usual deep water speed. From then on, no more mollusks, no more zoophytes, no more articulates just a few large fish sweeping by like shadows. During the night of February 16th through 17th, we entered the second Mediterranean basin, whose maximum depth we found at 3,000 meters. The Nautilus, driven downward by its propeller and slanting fins, descended to the lowest strata of this sea. There, in place of natural wonders, the watery mass offered some thrilling and dreadful scenes to my eyes. In essence, we were then crossing that part of the whole Mediterranean so fertile in casualties. From the coast of Algiers to the beaches of Providence, how many ships have wrecked, how many vessels have vanished. Compared to the vast liquid plains of the Pacific, the Mediterranean is a mere lake, but it's an unpredictable lake with fickle waters, today kindly and affectionate to those frail single masters drifting between a double ultramarine of sky and water, tomorrow bad-tempered and turbulent, agitated by the winds, demolishing the strongest ships beneath sudden waves that smash down with a headlong wallop. So, in our swift cruise through these deep strata, how many vessels I saw lying on the sea floor! Some already caked with coral, others clad only in a layer of rust, plus anchors, cannons, shells, iron fittings, propeller blades, parts of engines, cracked cylinders, staved in boilers, then hulls floating in mid-water, here upright, there overturned. Some of these wrecked ships had perished in collisions, others from hitting granite reefs. I saw a few that had sunk straight down their masting still upright, their rigging stiffened by the water. They looked like they were at anchor by some immense open offshore mooring where they were waiting for their departure time. When the Nautilus passed between them, covering them with sheets of electricity, they seemed ready to salute up with their colors and send us their serial numbers. But no, nothing but silence and death filled this field of catastrophes. I observed that these Mediterranean depths became more and more cluttered with such gruesome wreckage as the Nautilus drew nearer the Strait of Gibraltar. By then, the shores of Africa and Europe were converging, and in this narrow space, collisions were commonplace. There I saw numerous iron undersides, the phantasmagoric ruins of steamers, some lying down, others rearing up like fearsome animals. One of these boats made a dreadful first impression, sides torn open, funnel bent, paddle wheels stripped to the mountings, rudder separated from the stern post and still hanging from its iron chain, the board on its stern eaten away by marine salts. How many lives were dashed in this shipwreck? How many victims were swept under by the waves? Had some sailor on board lived to tell the story of this dreadful disaster, or do the waves still keep this casualty a secret? It occurred to me, Lord knows why, that this boat buried under the sea might have been the Atlas, lost with all hands some twenty years ago, and never heard from again. Oh, what a gruesome tale these Mediterranean depths could tell! This huge boneyard where so much wealth has been lost, where so many victims have met their deaths. Meanwhile, briskly unconcerned, the Nautilus ran at full propeller through the midst of these ruins. On February 18th, near three o'clock in the morning, it hove before the entrance of the Strait of Gibraltar. There are two currents here, an upper current, long known to exist, that carries the ocean's waters into the Mediterranean basin, then a lower countercurrent, the only present-day proof of its existence being logic. In essence, the Mediterranean receives a continual influx of water, not only from the Atlantic, but from rivers emptying into it. Since local evaporation isn't enough to restore the balance, the total amount of added water should make the sea's level higher every year. Yet this isn't the case, and we're naturally forced to believe in the existence of some lower current that carries the Mediterranean surplus through the Strait of Gibraltar and into the Atlantic Basin. And so it turned out. The Nautilus took full advantage of this countercurrent. It advanced swiftly through this narrow passage. For an instant, I could glimpse the wonderful ruins of the Temple of Hercules, buried under sea, as Pilney and Evanius have mentioned, together with the flat island they stand on, and, a few minutes later, we were floating on the waves of the Atlantic. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 The Bay of Vigo The Atlantic a vast expanse of water whose surface area is 25 million square miles, with a length of 9,000 miles and an average width of 2,700. 
a major sea nearly unknown to the ancients, except perhaps the Carthaginians, those Dutchmen of antiquity who went along the west coasts of Europe and Africa on their commercial junkets, an ocean whose parallel winding shores form an immense perimeter fed by the world's greatest rivers, the St. Lawrence, Mississippi, Amazon, Plata, Orinoco, Niger, Senegal, Elbe, Loire, and Rhine, which bring it waters from the most civilized countries as well as the most undeveloped areas, a magnificent plain of waves ploughed continuously by ships of every nation, shaded by every flag in the world, and ending in those two dreadful headlands so feared by navigators, Cape Horn and the Cape of Tempests. The Nautilus broke these waters with the edge of its spur after doing nearly ten thousand leagues in three and a half months, a track longer than a great circle of the earth. Where were we heading now, and what did the future have in store for us? Emerging from the Strait of Gibraltar, the Nautilus took to the high seas. It returned to the surface of the waves, so our daily strolls on the platform were restored to us. I climbed onto it instantly, Ned Land and Conseil along with me. Twelve miles away, Cape St. Vincent was hazily visible, the southwestern tip of the Hispanic Peninsula. The wind was blowing a pretty strong gust from the south. The sea was swelling and surging. Its waves made the Nautilus roll and jerk violently. It was nearly impossible to stand up on the platform, which was continuously buffeted by this enormously heavy sea. After inhaling a few breaths of air, we went below once more. I repaired to my stateroom. Conseil returned to his cabin, but the Canadian, looking rather worried, followed me. Our quick trip through the Mediterranean hadn't allowed him to put his plans into execution, and he could barely conceal his disappointment. After the door to my stateroom was closed, he sat and stared at me silently. "'Ned, my friend,' I told him, "'I know how you feel, but you mustn't blame yourself. Given the way the Nautilus was navigating, it would have been sheer insanity to think of escaping.' Ned Land didn't reply. His pursed lips and frowning brow indicated that he was in the grip of his monomania. "'Look here,' I went on. "'As yet there's no cause for despair. We're going up the coast of Portugal. France and England aren't far off, and there we'll easily find refuge. Oh, I grant you, if the Nautilus had emerged from the Strait of Gibraltar and made for that cape in the south, if it were taking us towards those regions that have no continents, then I'd share your alarm.' but we now know that Captain Nemo doesn't avoid the seas of civilization, and in a few days I think we can safely take action. Ned Land stared at me still more intently, and finally unpursed his lips. "'We'll do it this evening,' he said. I straightened suddenly. I admit that I was less than ready for this announcement. I wanted to reply to the Canadian, but words failed me. "'We agreed to wait for the right circumstances,' Ned Land went on. "'Now we've got those circumstances.' This evening will be just a few miles off the coast of Spain. It'll be cloudy tonight. The wind's blowing toward shore. You gave me your promise, Professor Aronnax, and I'm counting on you. Since I didn't say anything, the Canadian stood up and approached me. We'll do it this evening at nine o'clock, he said. I've alerted Conseil. By that time, Captain Nemo will be locked in his room and probably in bed. Neither the mechanics or the crewmen will be able to see us. Conseil and I will go to the central companionway. As for you, Professor Aronnax, you'll stay in the library two steps away and wait for my signal. The oars, mast, and sail are in the skiff. I've even managed to stow some provisions inside. I've gotten hold of a monkey wrench to unscrew the nuts bolting the skiff to the Nautilus's hull, so everything's ready. I'll see you this evening. The sea is rough, I said. Admitted, the Canadian replied. But we've got to risk it. Freedom is worth paying for. Besides, the longboat's solidly built, and a few miles with the wind behind us is no big deal. By tomorrow, who knows if this ship won't be one hundred leagues out to sea? If circumstances are in our favor, between ten and eleven this evening, we'll be landing on some piece of solid ground, or we'll be dead. So we're in God's hands, and I'll see you this evening. This said, the Canadian withdrew, leaving me close to dumbfounded. I had imagined that if it came to this I would have time to think about it, to talk it over. My stubborn companion hadn't granted me this courtesy. But after all, what would I have said to him? Ned Land was right a hundred times over. These were near-ideal circumstances, and he was taking full advantage of them. 
In my selfish personal interests, could I go back on my word and be responsible for ruining the future lives of my companions? Tomorrow might not Captain Nemo take us far away from any shore? Just then a fairly loud hissing told me that the ballast tanks were filling, and the Nautilus sank beneath the waves of the Atlantic. I stayed in my stateroom. I wanted to avoid the captain to hide from his eyes the agitation overwhelming me. What an agonizing day I spent, torn between my desire to regain my free will and my regret at abandoning this marvelous Nautilus, leaving my underwater research incomplete. How could I relinquish this ocean, my own Atlantic, as I liked to call it, without observing its lower strata, without wresting from it the kinds of secrets that had been revealed to me by the seas of the East Indies and the Pacific? I was putting down my novel half-read. I was waking up as my dream neared its climax. How painfully the hours passed, as I sometimes envisioned myself safe on shore with my companions, or, despite my better judgment, as I sometimes wished that some unforeseen circumstances would prevent Ned Land from carrying out his plans. Twice I went to the lounge. I wanted to consult the compass. I wanted to see if the Nautilus's heading was actually taking us closer to the coast or spiriting us farther away. But no, the Nautilus was still in Portuguese waters. Heading north it was cruising along the ocean's beaches. So I had to resign myself to my fate and get ready to escape. My baggage wasn't heavy, my notes nothing more. As for Captain Nemo, I wondered what he would make of our escaping, what concern or perhaps what distress it might cause him, and what he would do in the twofold event of our attempt, either failing or being found out. Certainly I had no complaints to register with him, on the contrary. Never was hospitality more whole-hearted than his. Yet in leaving him I couldn't be accused of ingratitude. No solemn promises bound us to him. In order to keep us captive, he had counted only on the force of circumstances and not on our word of honor. But his avowed intention to imprison us forever on his ship justified our every effort. I hadn't seen the captain since our visit to the island of Santorini. Would fate bring me into his presence before our departure? I both desired and dreaded it. I listened for footsteps in the stateroom adjoining mine. Not a sound reached my ear. His stateroom had to be deserted. Then I began to wonder if this eccentric individual was even on board. Since that night when the skiff had left the Nautilus on some mysterious mission, my ideas about him had subtly changed. In spite of everything, I thought that Captain Nemo must have kept up some type of relationship with the shore. Did he himself never leave the Nautilus? Whole weeks had often gone by without my encountering him. What was he doing all the while? During all those times I'd thought he was convalescing in the grip of some misanthropic fit. Was he instead far away from the ship, involved in some secret activity whose nature still eluded me? All these ideas and a thousand others assaulted me at the same time. In these strange circumstances the scope for conjecture was unlimited. I felt an unbearable queasiness. This day of waiting seemed endless. The hours struck too slowly to keep up with my impatience. As usual, dinner was served me in my stateroom. Full of anxiety, I ate little. I left the table at seven o'clock. One hundred twenty minutes, I was keeping track of them, still separated me from the moment I was to rejoin Ned Land. My agitation increased. My pulse was throbbing violently. I couldn't stand still. I walked up and down, hoping to calm my troubled mind with movement. The possibility of perishing in our reckless undertaking was the least of my worries. My heart was pounding at the thought that our plans might be discovered before we had left the Nautilus, at the thought of being hauled in front of Captain Nemo and finding him angered, or worse, saddened, by my deserting him. I wanted to see the lounge one last time. I went down the gangways and arrived at the museum where I had spent so many pleasant and productive hours. I stared at all its wealth, all its treasures, like a man on the eve of his eternal exile, a man departing to return no more. For so many days now these natural wonders and artistic masterworks had been central to my life, and I was about to leave them behind forever. I wanted to plunge my eyes through the lounge window and into these Atlantic waters, but the panels were hermetically sealed, 
and a mantle of sheet iron separated me from this ocean with which I was still unfamiliar. Crossing through the lounge, I arrived at the door, contrived in one of the canted corners, that opened into the captain's stateroom. Much to my astonishment, this drawer was ajar. I instinctively recoiled. If Captain Nemo was in his stateroom, he might see me. But, not hearing any sounds, I approached. The stateroom was deserted. I pushed the door open. I took a few steps inside. Still the same austere monastic appearance. Just then my eye was caught by some etchings hanging on the wall, which I hadn't noticed during my first visit. They were portraits of great men of history who had spent their lives in perpetual devotion to a great human ideal. Thaddeus Kosciusko, the hero whose dying words had been Finis Poloniae. Footnote. Latin. Save Poland's borders. Ed. End of footnote. Marcos Botzaris, for modern Greece the reincarnation of Sparta's King Leonidas. Daniel O'Connell, Ireland's defender. George Washington, founder of the American Union. Danielle Menin, the Italian patriot. Abraham Lincoln, dead from the bullet of a believer in slavery. And finally, that martyr for the redemption of the black race, John Brown, hanging from his gallows as Victor Hugo's pencil has so terrifyingly depicted. What was the bond between these heroic souls and the soul of Captain Nemo? From this collection of portraits could I finally unravel the mystery of his existence? Was he a fighter for oppressed peoples, a liberator of enslaved races? Had he figured in the recent political or social upheavals of this century? Was he a hero of that dreadful civil war in America, a war lamentable yet forever glorious? Suddenly the clock struck eight. The first stroke of its hammer on the chime snapped me out of my musings. I shuddered, as if some invisible eye had plunged into my innermost thoughts, and I rushed outside the stateroom. There my eyes fell on the compass. Our heading was still northerly. The log indicated a moderate speed, the pressure gauge a depth of about sixty feet. So circumstances were in favor of the Canadian's plans. I stayed in my stateroom. I dressed warmly, fishing boots, otter cap, coat of fan-muscle fabric lined with sealskin. I was ready. I was waiting. Only the propeller's vibrations disturbed the deep silence reigning on board. I cocked an ear and listened. Would a sudden outburst of voices tell me that Ned Land's escape plans had just been detected? A ghastly uneasiness stole through me. I tried in vain to recover my composure. A few minutes before nine o'clock I glued my ear to the captain's door, not a sound. I left my stateroom and returned to the lounge, which was deserted and plunged in near darkness. I opened the door leading to the library. The same inadequate light, the same solitude. I went to man my post near the door opening into the well of the central companionway. I waited for Ned Land's signal. At this point the propeller's vibration slowed down appreciably, then they died out altogether. Why was the Nautilus stopping? Whether this layover would help or hinder Ned Land's schemes, I couldn't have said. The silence was further disturbed only by the pounding of my heart. Suddenly I felt a mild jolt. I realized the Nautilus had come to rest on the ocean floor. My alarm increased. The Canadian's signal hadn't reached me. I longed to rejoin Ned Land and urge him to postpone his attempt. I sensed that we were no longer navigating under normal conditions. Just then, the door to the main lounge opened and Captain Nemo appeared. He saw me, and without further preamble, "'Ah, Professor,' he said in an affable tone, "'I've been looking for you. Do you know your Spanish history?' Even if he knew it by heart, a man in my disturbed, befuddled condition couldn't have quoted a syllable of his own country's history." Well, Captain Nemo went on, did you hear my question? Do you know the history of Spain? Very little of it, I replied. The most learned men, the captain said, still have much to learn. Have a seat, he added, and I'll tell you about an unusual episode in this body of history. The captain stretched out on a couch and I mechanically took a seat near him, but half in the shadows. Professor, he said, Listen carefully. 
This piece of history concerns you in one definite respect, because it will answer a question you've no doubt been unable to resolve. I'm listening, Captain, I said, not knowing what my partner in this dialogue was driving at, and wondering if this incident related to our escape plans. Professor, Captain Nemo went on, if you're amenable, we'll go back in time to 1702. You're aware of the fact that in those days your King Louis the Fourteenth thought an imperial gesture would suffice to humble the Pyrenees in the dust, so he inflicted his grandson, the Duke of Anjou, on the Spaniards. Reigning more or less poorly under the name King Philip V, this aristocrat had to deal with mighty opponents abroad. In essence, the year before, the royal houses of Holland, Austria, and England had signed a treaty of alliance at The Hague, aiming to wrest the Spanish crown from King Philip V, and to place it on the head of an archduke whom they prematurely dubbed King Charles III. Spain had to withstand these allies, but the country had practically no army or navy. Yet it wasn't short of money, provided that its galleons laden with gold and silver from America could enter its ports. Now then, late in 1702 Spain was expecting a rich convoy, which France ventured to escort with a fleet of twenty-three vessels under the command of Admiral de Chateau Renault, because by that time the Allied navies were roving the Atlantic. This convoy was supposed to put into Cadiz, but after learning that the English fleet lay across those waterways, the Admiral decided to make for a French port. The Spanish commanders in the convoy objected to this decision. They wanted to be taken to a Spanish port, if not to Cadiz, then to the Bay of Vigo, located on Spain's northwest coast and not blockaded. Admiral de Chateau Renault was so indecisive as to obey this directive, and the galleons entered the Bay of Vigo. Unfortunately, this bay forms an open offshore mooring that's impossible to defend, so it was essential to hurry and empty the galleons before the Allied fleets arrived, and there would have been ample time for this unloading if a wretched question of trade agreements hadn't suddenly come up. "'Are you clear on the chain of events?' Captain Nemo asked me. "'Perfectly clear,' I said, not yet knowing why I was being given this history lesson. "'Then I'll continue. Here's what came to pass.' The tradesmen of Cadiz had negotiated a charter whereby they were to receive all merchandise coming from the West Indies. Now then, unloading the ingots from those galleons at the port of Vigo would have been a violation of their rights. So they lodged a complaint in Madrid, and they obtained an order from the indecisive King Philip V. Without unloading, the convoy would stay in custody at the offshore mooring of Vigo until the enemy fleets had retreated. Now then, just as this decision was being handed down, English vessels arrived in the Bay of Vigo on October 22, 1702. Despite his inferior forces, Admiral de Chateau Renault fought courageously, but when he saw that the convoy's wealth was about to fall into enemy hands, he burned and scuttled the galleons, which went to the bottom with their immense treasures. Captain Nemo stopped. I admit it, I still couldn't see how this piece of history concerned me. Well, I asked him. Well, Professor Aranax, Captain Nemo answered me, we are actually in that Bay of Vigo, and all that's left is for you to probe the mysteries of the place. The captain stood up and invited me to follow him. I'd had time to collect myself. I did so. The lounge was dark, but the sea's waves sparkled through the transparent windows. I stared. Around the Nautilus for a half-mile radius the waters seemed saturated with electric light. The sandy bottom was clear and bright. Dressed in diving suits, crewmen were busy clearing away half-rotted barrels and disemboweled trunks in the midst of the dingy hulks of ships. Out of these trunks and kegs spilled ingots of gold and silver, cascades of jewels, pieces of eight. The sand was heaped with them. Then, laden with these valuable spoils, the men returned to the Nautilus, dropped off their burdens inside, and went to resume this inexhaustible fishing for silver and gold. I understood. 
This was the setting of that battle on October 22nd, 1702. Here in this very place those galleons carrying treasure to the Spanish government had gone to the bottom. Here, whenever he needed, Captain Nemo came to withdraw these millions to ballast his Nautilus. It was for him, for him alone, that America had yielded up its precious metals. He was the direct sole heir to these treasures wrested from the Incas and those peoples conquered by Hernando Cortes. "'Did you know, Professor?' he asked me with a smile, that the sea contained such wealth. I know it's estimated, I replied, that there are two million metric tons of silver held in suspension in seawater. Surely, but in extracting that silver, your expenses would outweigh your profits. Here, by contrast, I have only to pick up what other men have lost, and not only in this Bay of Vigo, but at a thousand other sites where ships have gone down, whose positions are marked on my underwater chart. Do you understand now that I am rich to the tune of billions? I understand, Captain. Nevertheless, allow me to inform you that by harvesting this very Bay of Vigo, you are simply forestalling the efforts of a rival organization. What organization? A company chartered by the Spanish government to search for these sunken galleons. The company's investors were lured by the bait of enormous gains, because this scuttled treasure is estimated to be worth five hundred million francs. It was five hundred million francs, Captain Nemo replied, but no more. Right, I said. Hence a timely warning to those investors would be an act of charity. Yet who knows if it would be well received. Usually what gamblers regret the most isn't the loss of their money so much as the loss of their insane hopes. But ultimately I feel less sorry for them than for the thousands of unfortunate people who would have benefited from a fair distribution of this wealth, whereas now it will be of no help to them. No sooner had I voiced this regret than I felt it must have wounded Captain Nemo. No help, he replied with growing animation. Sir, what makes you assume this wealth goes to waste when I am the one amassing it? Do you think I toil to gather this treasure out of selfishness? Who says I don't put it to good use? Do you think I'm unaware of the suffering beings and oppressed races living on this earth? Poor people to comfort, victims to avenge, don't you understand? Captain Nemo stopped on these last words, perhaps sorry that he had said too much. But I had guessed. Whatever motives had driven him to seek independence under the seas, he remained a human being before all else. His heart still throbbed for suffering humanity, and his immense philanthropy went out both to downtrodden races and to individuals. And now I knew where Captain Nemo had delivered those millions when the Nautilus navigated the waters where Crete was in rebellion against the Ottoman Empire. End of chapter 8